Now, a lot of new gardeners are terrified by the very word compost, but I'm here to tell you that composting isn't difficult, nor does it have to be complicated. After all, it's just a natural process, and all we're doing is speeding it up. In this video, I'm going to take you through everything that you need to know to be proficient at making compost at home. I'm Tony O'Neill and this is UK Here We Grow and on this channel we deal with all things gardening, poultry keeping and beekeeping. If you want that perfect garden to relax in or just want to grow your own nutrient dense foods then start now by clicking the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified each time I release new content just like this. So what's the definition of composting? Well composting is basically just taking a load of plant material allowing it to rot down which provides a fertilizer so that you can improve the conditions of your soils. Now I'd like to add you that manures from herbivores like cows, sheep, horses, llamas, guinea pigs, rabbits, chickens, they are also classed as composts. Now manures from carnivores like cats and dogs shouldn't be added to your compost. So here's what you can add. All plant material from the garden, fruit and vegetable kitchen scraps, cooked pasta and rice, cardboard boxes from packaging, but you must remove a plastic tape or any windows that are in the envelopes, newspaper which is shredded, old stale bread, crackers or tortilla chips, crisps, things like that, used coffee grounds, used tea bags minus the bag itself because this contains plastic, dog, human hair, horse, cow, sheep, rabbit, poultry, alpaca and goat manures, straw, hay, wood chips, worm castings, tree cuttings, wool, bracken, ash from burnt hardwood, sawdust and leaves. So here's a few things that you should add. Now, not because they wouldn't break down, but because they would possibly attract vermin, things like rats and other rodents. And these are meat, raw and cooked, fish, cheese, milk, dog or cat manures, the tea bags themselves, uh, glossy or coated paper or cardboard, coal fire ash, sawdust from treated timber, large branches as they will steal nitrogen while trying to break down, and chemical fertilizers. So before even starting our own compost pile, we need to know how to build it. Now, you could simply just pile things up in the middle of the ground and cover it over with a tarp. And that does work, but it can take an age to break down if you don't get the amounts of carbon and nitrogen ratio correct. But I will speak more about that a bit later on. Another way would be to use these plastic Dalek style bins and the also the rotating bins because these are products that you can purchase, they're quick, they're easy, they look nice in the garden and they're not too unsightly. So these are also good. Now, if you notice, these are quite tall and that's for a reason, we'll go more into that later as well. And the third alternative that you have here is you could compost directly in the ground by digging a trench, putting in your ingredients and just covering it over. And the last but not least would be to build your own. Something from pallets or timber, something like these would be really, really good for composting. And it can be as basic as just a couple of steaks and some chicken wire mesh or you could go to what I have done here with a five bay system. So how do you know how much of what to put in your compost? Well that's a bit of a bigger question but essentially every component that you add into your compost is either greens like these leaves or plant materials here or browns like this straw or leaves here. Now the greens, they contain nitrogen and this is needed to uh, help break down the pile. And the browns are a carbon source which gives the body and you also need those as well. But that leads on to the next question. So that question is, what is the right ratio of greens to browns? Well, the ratio that you wanna be looking at is around 30 to one. 30 parts brown to one part green. And you may have heard this being thrown around, but what does it actually mean? Because 
All too often you see people saying, well, I've done this, I've done that, but my compost isn't breaking down. And we're gonna go right through that right now so you understand it. Okay, so too many people who garden throw this ratio around 30 to one, but they don't really understand it. Now, the 30 to one ratio is not a volume ratio. So we wouldn't put 30 parts brown into one part nitrogen in volume because this would never break down and it's the number one reason why a lot of people who struggle to make their compost break down is having that issue because they are not putting in the right ratios because they're using volumes so the important thing here is to know the carbon to the nitrogen ratio of the products that you're putting into your compost so how do you know what a product contains, how much carbon to nitrogen it contains. Well, this table here will actually show you that. But furthermore, it's really important again understanding that everything you add to your compost will contain both carbon and nitrogen rather than just um, just carbon or nitrogen okay so it's not just a green or brown like you're led to believe with a lot of text that is out there at the moment it will contain both carbon and nitrogen so now you know that you can make a little bit more sense from this table and I urge you to save this video and come back to it so that you can see what these products contain and these are products that tend to get used mostly in people's compost okay so as you can see from the tables that simply adding 30 times more browns over greens to your compost isn't going to work for you because it doesn't break down. Instead, we need to consider the carbon and the nitrogen ratios. And that's the important bit here. Uh, too many TV programs and text try to simplify this, but the message doesn't really get across. And that's why I'm making this video. So if we were to just add weeds to our compost bin as you can see from the chart we're pretty much set because there's about 30 uh, times more carbon over nitrogen in weeds so you can literally just throw them on the compost and have done with it but if we were adding wood chips and grass clippings then we would need roughly around 16 times more grass clippings in volume than we would wood chips because wood chips contain like 400 parts or 400 percent um, carbon and no nitrogen so we need to offset that with the nitrogen from the grass clippings and you would need roughly about 16 times more so with this in mind you now have an understanding to make some sense from these tables so that you can look back and refer to these tables and think right okay i've got this this and this what do i need to mix or what volumes do i need to mix and going back when you're making your compost don't just keep adding stuff to it store stuff like you saw earlier on with the bags and things in in front of my compost base i've saved those so i can show you how to make this compost but um you save these things in an empty bin somewhere and then you can add the amounts that you require for compost now a lot of people will tell you this isn't needed and you can just pretty much cut it up and throw it in and it will break down and that will happen over time but if you want to make good quality compost you need to sort of follow these rules so when you're making compost just like making a cake there's a recipe for it now in this particular recipe we have four ingredients and the first of those we've covered which are the greens and the browns or the carbon and the nitrogen there's two other ingredients the first of those is water and the second is air now we need water and air in the compost for a couple of reasons but the main reason is it provides a healthy environment for the microbes and the bacteria that are going to come into this compost and break it down because it, without those you will never rot down the process you need the bacteria and the microbes in which for the compost to heat up and work water is one of the most important ingredients in any compost and the reason for this is that the microbes need a moist humid and warm environment in which to breed without water in the compost these microbes not only can't breed but they will likely die 
So getting the water right in your compost is really important because if it's too wet, the microbes slow down when they're breeding. And if it's too dry, they slow down when they're breeding. So just like Goldilocks and the three bears, it needs to be just right. Here's some things you can look for to tell you whether your compost is too wet. Now you'll see water running out of the sides or the bottom of your compost bins. The product inside will be matted together in big chunks like this and this is hard because it has no air in it then because of this matting. And also you will get a, an ammonia smell coming through and this is telling you that the pile is turning anaerobic. So the idea behind this is so that you can understand what's happening in your compost. Now, if your compost is too wet, the microbes will slow down breeding firstly, and if they continues to be too wet and it turns anaerobic, those microbes will die. And without the microbes, you can end up with a big slimy, smelly mess. So too dry. Well, when it's too dry, the composting process slows drastically and the compost itself looks really dusty and you may even get a colony of ants move in. Now, just like human beings, microbes need water to survive. And just like if it's too wet, when it's too dry, the microbes start to die. And when they die, this composting process is over. It stops completely. So what do you want to do when you're making your compost is you're looking for a nice moist compost something that when you grab an handful and squeeze it only one or two drops of water maximum comes out of your hand and then it should form into a clump but when you break it up it should also break back up then you know you have the perfect moisture content in your compost so we come to the fourth ingredient in our compost which is air so why do we need air in our compost well, as we've already discussed, composting is basically the rotting down process of plant materials, and that is done by microbes. Now, microbes, in order to breed, need water, food, and air, just like human beings do. So, by providing the air, they utilize this air and the food and the water, and they uh, breed and during the breakdown process of the plant material, the microbes put out a byproduct, which is heat. Now, if we didn't keep adding air, the microbes will start to die off because they're unable to breathe due to the numbers that they're creating. There are billions and billions of them in a compost heap. So that's why it's quite important to turn your compost. Turning your compost adds lots of air into the compost, speeds up the process, and the more heat that comes tells you that the microbes are breeding well and they are breaking down more and more. Now, eventually what happens is the compost breaks down enough and then it's able to cool down and continue breaking down because other insects and worms and things like that will move into the compost pile. But initially, we want to get that heat building really, really well. Now we know exactly how we make our compost. What compost bins are best? Well, a lot of people will just mound all their compost into a huge pile, they'll cover it with a tarp, and they'll get some fantastic compost, and it works to great effect. But it, a lot of people, they do this in their own back gardens, and the last thing you'll want to see is a big, huge a pile of compost like I've got down there and which is covered over with a tarp and depending on your budget that's where things like this will come in you can go for a basic Dalek style compost bin and these simply load from the top and as you can see in here I'm using these ones for my leaf mold now the the good thing about these is they're cheap they look okay in a garden they keep out the rain and you can control the moisture and the air in there. Now, I built some compost bins further down, so these have all been assigned to my leaf mold now. 
but essentially you could buy these or you could even go for a rotivating compost bin that's on its side and you can literally just turn this with a, a handle so that saves you having to get in there with a fork and they're ideal for people with mobility issues things like that and then you go down the DIY methods which is a compost based system like I have here now there are all sorts of types and it could be just a couple of stakes in the ground with some wire mesh around it or you could go as elaborate as i have here and this this entire base system is made out of pallets and all i've done is wrap them in some floor protection and we have pallets that can lift out in the front and i've broken them down into two pieces to be able to lift in and out very very easily now there are a couple of rules when it comes to composting. You don't want to spread your compost pile out because the compost pile will cool too quickly. You want to heat it. So if you're going to make a compost pile, whether it's in a bin like this, or you're going to make your own DIY compost bin, make it high. The bigger the pile you have, the hotter it will get and the slower it takes to cool down. How quick can you make your compost? Well, that's quite a broad question and it really depends on a number of factors. The first of them is what ingredients you're putting in your compost, how big your compost pieces are and how high you've piled your compost will be a few factors within the length of time it takes to make your compost. But here's a few tips for you. Make sure that you pile your compost high. The second tip there is make sure you've got the correct amount of greens and browns or carbon and nitrogen as we discussed earlier on. The third one is make sure it's got the right amount of water and the fourth one is that you turn that compost. Another one that I will say here is that you really need to shred your product down as small as possible. The smaller you cut this down and the time you take to do that, the quicker your compost will make. And then once you've done that, there are a few other tips that we can get. One of them is to invest in one of these. Now, this is a compost thermometer. It will tell me every time my compost cools down because then once I know when it's cooled down, I can then turn that compost again. And if, if you turn that compost every time it cools down, you introduce more air, you can check for the water. Remember, as I said about gripping it, if two drops drop out, it's wet enough. If not, then add water to the compost. And that's really all it is to it, guys. Those few tips in order to produce some really good quality compost in which to uh, ensure that you are building soil structure, soil water retention, and also bring in all the life into your soil. It really is worth doing. What to do with the finished compost? Well, first of all, let me congratulate you on actually creating your first batch of compost because this stuff is golden when it comes to the garden. And there's so much you can do with it. And here's a few ideas of what you can do with your compost. So you can use it as a mulch to go around trees and other plants and putting compost down as a mulch is really good for suppressing weeds and adding nutrition to the ground and the worms will take this down. It can be used if you sieve it as part of a compost mix or a potting mix so that you can plant your seedlings into. It's fantastic for building soil structure. Not only does it help build the soil structure, it'll create pockets and it will also aid in water retention in your soil. So where you get hot summers, you're less likely to get the cracking, especially that you would get in clay soils. It's also fantastic if you've got sandy soils and silty soils because it adds that organic matter, which, can, which again holds that moisture for you. So this can be pretty much used as uh, general fertilizer just to put around your plants as we've already discussed and one other thing now if you've watched my channel for any amount of time you know that I am an advocate of growing potatoes in containers and in fact earlier on in this episode I was sat in front of a few of those when I was talking to you now a lot of people when I've showed videos on that I thought 
wow, you must be spending a fortune on compost. And indeed, for those potato videos, I was using compost out of a bag. And the reason for that was because I can still add that compost to the soil. But you imagine being able to grow. Look how fluffy this is. Even though it's got sticks and things still in it, this is nice and fluffy. Your spuds would grow really, really well in this. And if you're producing all your own at home, then you could continue to grow spuds in it. And then after that year of grown potatoes, this could then go out into your soil to enrich the soil as before. So you're getting multiple uses out of it. So now all you need to do is get out there and make your own compost. You're now in control of your own soil quality. I hope this has cleared up any challenges you've faced with making compost before. Question of the day, how do you make compost at home? Do you do anything different? Let's continue the conversation down below in the comments section. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Let's see if we can get a thousand thumbs up on this video today and share it with your friends. And if you've got value from this video, then you can subscribe here. And when you've done that, you can continue the journey by watching one of these videos right here. I'm Tony O'Neill. This is UK Here We Grow. And remember folks, you reap what you sow. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.